Zealandia is the world's lost continent by the Pacific. It doesn't appear on conventional maps because about 94% of its surface is submerged underwater. Only New Zealand, New Caledonia and Norfolk Island rise above sea level. The continental crust covers nearly 5 million square kilometers, which is about half the size of Europe, and sits separately from the Australian landmass. Besides the science, Zealandia could be a game changer. It could redefine maritime boundaries at a time when great powers like China and the United States are scrambling for influence and control in the Pacific. I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Today's episode is made possible by NordVPN. If you want to reduce your digital footprint, check out NordVPN. It's affordable, user-friendly, and it works on mobile devices as well. Go to nordvpn.com slash caspianreport and use the promo code caspianreport to get a discount on the premium version. The discovery of Zealandia is not a sudden occurrence, but a gradual realization made possible by the procurement of accumulated data, particularly over the last 10 years. What's interesting is that a few months ago, scientists revealed a precise mapping of Zealandia and its ocean floor. When looking at the bathymetric map of Zealandia, which is a topographic outline for underwater elevation, you'll notice that the submerged continent is significantly higher than the surrounding ocean crust. Look even closer and you might even catch a glimpse of what were once canyons, rivers and deltas. Mapping a bathymetric outline of this detail is incredibly complicated and requires years of extensive research. Yet, as fascinating as the science is, the breakthrough also holds real-life consequences for the Pacific. The nations in the Pacific are no stranger to global competition, stemming from their highly strategic location and numerous resources. From the 16th to the 20th century, Spain, Germany, Britain, France, Japan and the United States all took part in the scramble for the Pacific. To this day, some islands, like France's New Caledonia, remain as overseas territories of these great powers. The chain of islands in Melanesia, Micronesia and Polynesia make for an invaluable buffer separating the influences of Asia and America. And at a time when China is pursuing plans for regional supremacy, when Japan is awakening to geostrategic ambitions, and when the economies in Southeast Asia are driving global growth, the Pacific Ocean takes on a decisive space in the conduct of international affairs. Sitting at the southern edge of the Pacific, far away from the epicenters of global competition, New Zealand has taken somewhat of a passive geopolitical attitude for much of its history. The country has preferred to invest in its own holdings. As a result, New Zealand is one of the most competitive states in the periphery. Its territory consists of two main islands, as well as an estimated 600 smaller, mostly uninhabited islands of its shores. The most important islands include the Stewart Island, the Campbell Island, the Antipodes Islands, the Chatham Islands, the Kermadec Islands, the Bounty Islands, and finally the Auckland Islands. Most of these islands are located hundreds of kilometers from the mainland, and they play a crucial role in the defense of New Zealand. Still further away from the mainland, New Zealand also holds a few domains that are referred to as realms. These are self-governing territories that are united under a junior partnership with the central government in Wellington. The realm includes the Cook Islands, Tokelau Islands and Niue Island. Combined with these secondary territories, New Zealand has an extraordinarily large marine area when compared with its terrestrial holdings. The level of jurisdiction over these areas is determined by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which divides ownership of marine space in three sectors, each with its regulations and implications. The first is the Territorial Sea, which extends 22.2 kilometers from the coastal baseline 
New Zealand has full sovereignty within this space. Foreign ships cannot enter it without permission, let alone exploit the mineral and fishing resources. Then there is the exclusive economic zone, which goes beyond the territorial sea and extends 370.4 kilometers from the coast. New Zealand has exclusive rights to the living and non-living marine resources below the surface of the sea. Wellington can either exploit these possessions on its own or license other firms to do it instead. Finally, there is the continental shelf that surrounds a landmass where the sea is relatively shallow compared to the open ocean. The continental shelf is geologically part of the land and, under international law, a state retains exclusive rights over the non-living resources but the claim cannot exceed 648 kilometers from the coast. Taken together, each of New Zealand's islands and territories come with their own territorial sea, exclusive economic zone, and where possible, even an extended continental shelf, thus granting Wellington the ninth largest maritime space in the world. Currently, its exclusive economic zone covers a little over 4 million square kilometers, which is about 15 times the land area of the country, and beyond that has rights to an area of the continental shelf covering about 1.7 million square kilometers. However, claiming a continental shelf is not easy. It requires extensive scientific research that is entirely the responsibility of the petitioner. Not every nation has the expertise, funding, or even the political commitment to explore and map its continental shelf, and the results do not always pay off. But in a way, the mapping of deep sea bathymetry is the final frontier of exploration on our planet. And sometimes, the discovery has the potential to change the geopolitical course. New Zealand submitted its claim on the extended continental shelf in 2003, and the UN ratified it in 2008. Wherever New Zealand's extended continental shelf overlapped with the boundaries of Australia or New Caledonia, the involved nations resolved their differences in bilateral agreements by following the principles of equidistance. The most recent such agreement is the 2004 Australia-New Zealand Maritime Treaty. However, since then things have changed due to the mapping of Zealandia. The underwater mountain range surrounding New Zealand is no longer described as oceanic but as continental, which changes the judicial classification. With the new map of Zealandia, New Zealand could technically make a new claim to extend its continental shelf beyond the existing equidistances with Australia and New Caledonia. So as big as New Zealand's marine area is, it is likely to get even bigger. And this increase in marine territory would add tens of billions of dollars to the treasury of the state, but it would also inadvertently lead to greater involvement in the Pacific. China has been working diligently to extend its hold over the Pacific, which it considers a valuable space for a multitude of reasons. First, because it is the only route linking China to South America, Australia, New Zealand and Antarctica. Second, the Pacific waters are rich in mining and fishing resources, which Beijing desperately needs. Third, spreading its influence in the Pacific is Beijing's way of countering America's presence near its borders, more specifically in Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, the Philippines and the South China Sea. So to dominate the Pacific, China has been trying to flip the independent but small nations with predatory loans. Over the past decade, Beijing has scaled its commercial activity in the Pacific, funneling more than $6 billion in grants and concessional loans to construct roads, ports, airfields, etc. These projects are part of China's debt trap strategy that sees vulnerable countries targeted with unsustainable debts with the intention of generating political leverage. Many of the small and remote islands in the Pacific are unable to foster a self-sustaining economy and thus look to leverage their strategic position to extract benefits from both the United States and China. Sometimes, however, those plans backfire and the local government pays the price by conceding something of strategic value. For instance, in September 2019, the government of the Solomon Islands cut ties with Taiwan and established relations with China instead. 
Four days later, Kiribati followed suit and switched diplomatic recognition to China. Vanuatu, meanwhile, could be the future site of a Chinese military base if the local government defaults on its debt repayments. As things stand now, the nations of Tonga, Vanuatu and Samoa are among the countries most heavily indebted to China. Meanwhile, competition for influence is mounting in Fiji, Palau, the Marshall Islands, the Solomon Islands and some parts of the Federated States of Micronesia. This is not to say that China has no rivals in the region, far from it. Currently, Australia is the biggest trade partner in the area and plans to increase its military spending by 40% over the next 10 years. At the same time, Washington is negotiating to renew its existing security pacts in the Pacific, which grant the United States exclusive military access to the land, air and sea routes of Micronesia, as well as Palau and the Marshall Islands. France, meanwhile, seeks to counter China by increasing its military and economic presence in its overseas territories of New Caledonia, French Polynesia and the territory of Wallis and Futuna Islands. So the United States and its allies still hold sway over the region, but cracks are starting to appear as China's influence grows. Only through a combined effort of New Zealand and Australia in the south, the United States and France in the west, can China's reach be encircled and contained in the Pacific. The mapping of Zealandia and New Zealand's still growing marine space makes Wellington that much more involved. In effect, New Zealand, with its maritime space sitting in between America, Australia and France, is the glue that holds the alliance in its place and suspense what would otherwise become the next scramble for the Pacific. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Please leave a like, comment and subscribe for the algorithm. Thank you for watching and Saul. So